Good afternoon. Um, I think I know almost all of you here, so I won't bother with introducing myself. Um, but um, I hope you're enjoying a wonderful Veterans Day uh, weekend holiday. And we are very grateful that uh, you have come to join us uh, for, I think, a very, very interesting uh, presentation um, uh, on Golda May Ear. Um, as you know, I usually do the introductions for the speakers, but today is a special event. Um, I um, first um, uh, became familiar with um, Panina Lahav through this extraordinary book that the University of California Press published over a decade ago. Uh, it's quite, quite a few years. This is a book on um, Shimon Agranat, who was the Chief Justice of the Israeli High Court of Justice, uh, and was involved in some extraordinary um, uh, juridical cases um, during his, his fantastic career. Um, I've read many books on uh, chief justices, um, and uh, this, is a, this is extraordinary. The chapter on um, the Eichmann trial is amazing. Uh, the discussion of the Kastner case is amazing. In fact, every chapter of this uh, extraordinary book, Judgment in Jerusalem, and I love it against the, um, the backdrop of Eichmann in Jerusalem, extraordinary title. So um, I was introduced to Professor Panina Lahav through my colleague, Laura Kalman from the History Department. And I have asked her um, to introduce Panina Lahav to us. So you first, please welcome my colleague, Laura Kalman from the History Department. Thanks, Richard. It's not often that I get to introduce a tremendous scholar who's also one of my closest friends. Panina Lahav is professor of law and law alumni scholar at Boston University School of Law. She received her degree, her law degree, magna cum laude from Hebrew University and her master of laws and doctorate from Yale Law School. At BU, where she's an award-winning professor, she teaches courses on constitutional law, civil rights and civil liberties, and comparative constitutional law. The Lahav corpus is distinctive for its breadth and depth on topics American and Israeli. Panina is the author of some 50 articles and several books, including Press Law and Modern Democracies, a, pr a Comparative Perspective. Her prize-winning judgment in Jerusalem is not just the best judicial biography I've ever read. It's the best biography, period. In it, Panina brilliantly uses the life of Simon Agranat, one of the first one of the first chief justices of the Israeli Supreme Court, to illuminate the history of Zionism, the history of Israel, the history of justice, and the history of law in Israel, which Panina shows has been deeply influenced by American law. She has written equally provocatively and insightfully about topics ranging from the women of the law, women of the wall, who launched women's legal struggle to pray at the Western Wall, to the Suez Crisis, to the history of legal education in Israel, to the trial of the Chicago Seven, to many other topics. She single-handedly established Israeli legal historiography as a field, and her work is viewed as foundational in fields ranging from biography to freedom of expression to women's rights. I wanted to say her work is foundational in fields ranging from A to Z, but I could only get from biography to women's rights, which is not too shabby. 
Panina is the past president of the Association for Israel, Israel Studies. She's the winner of many prizes and prestigious fellowships. Lest I take time away from her lecture, I won't, I won't list them all. I'll limit myself to noting that last year, she became the first legal scholar to win the Association for Israel Studies Lifetime Achievement Award. It goes to scholars whose lasting and path-breaking contributions have significantly changed the field of Israel studies. She will speak to us today on her nearly complete biography of Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, which explores how a woman broke that highest glass ceiling in a society even more chauvinistic than ours. Thank you very much. Let me open by saying how wonderful it is to be here in beautiful Santa Barbara and have an opportunity to present to you a biographical sketch of Golda Meir. I wish to thank Professor Richard Hecht for inviting me to give this lecture to my precious friend, Laura Kalman, for her generous introduction, to my dear friend, Jane DeHart, who's, who, for suggesting that I deliver this lecture, and many dear friends who are here uh, to hear me. I'm so overwhelmed and delighted to see everyone here. Golda's father, Moshe Mavubich, Moshe Yitzhak Mavubich, was settled in Milwaukee, was settled in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for about two years before his family joined him in 1906. The reunion, as Golda's older sister, Shane, recalled, was quite traumatic. Shane described, I quote, we disembarked the train and looked around. Is it possible that the man approaching us was father? An unfamiliar father stood before us. The beard was gone, the Jewish look was gone. He was dressed differently. This was not the same father. Shana continued to contemplate what went on in Moshe's mind when he saw his wife and daughters. The greenhorn was Americanizing. She wrote, and I quote, we left a bad impression in our appearance, wearing rugs, tired and unkempt. We looked to him like real paupers. He was embarrassed. A spirit of mutual alienation enveloped us, all of us. Let me unpack this passage, which depicts on the most intimate level, the encounter between the Jewish immigrant and the Golden Medina, as America was known among the Jews. In Russia, where Golda was born and where she spent the first eight years of his, her life, Jewish identity was visible. A Jewish man came with an unshaven beard, side locks, and always a large yarmulke or black hat to cover his head. In America, Moshe Yitzhak understood intuitively the medium was the message. The Jewish representation of self, presentation of self had to be discarded if one wished to blend in. So here you see the father with a tie and a shirt, looking uh, you know, quite fancy, and only a, a mustache here. And this is the mother, uh, Golda, older sister Shaina, and Tsipke, the little sister. The immediate task was to update the appearance of the Mabovich women. women. Within days, they were introduced to the concepts of downtown and the department store. Shaina reported, I quote, the abundance made us dizzy, but at the same time, gloomy. The American clothes seemed strange. The hat decorated with flowers that father insisted on buying for the, that the father insisted on buying for the teenage Shayna appeared to her as a Purim hat or a Halloween hat. For the father, dressing like the locals meant being dressed like human beings, like Menchin. The message was unmistakable. You must American, Americanize quickly shed your Russian Jewish identity. Fast forwarding to Golda's days in Kibbutz Merchavia, the early kibbutzim, as we know, were built on the, on the anti-fashion principle. Fashion was bourgeois and therefore decadent. When Golda arrived in the kibbutz, the daily uniform was a sack with three holes in it, 
for the head and the two arms. Golda recalled that she worked tirelessly to press the sack so as to, to make it more presentable. This was the legacy of her father. It, was always, it has always been important to keep to, for her to look presentable. Back to America in 1906. American identity also required American names. School teacher Mr. Finn helped the family reinvent itself. Moshe Yitzchak became Maurice, Bluma became Bella, Shayna became Jenny, and young Tsipke became Clara. Golda underwent the list change. Golda turned into Goldie, and that's how she was known to her American friends for the rest of her life. Only when arrival in Palestine, only upon arrival in Palestine, did she return to the name she was given at birth, Golda. Nor did Golda, upon making Aliyah, follow the Zionist injunction to reject the culture of exile, Galut, by Hebraizing her name. She could, but did not, adopt a Hebrew name, whether it was due to sheer stubbornness or to deep confidence about who she was, we shall never know. But we do know that she did love the hustle bustle of American life and conformed easily and quickly. Golda came from a working class family that did not put great emphasis on education. Thus, her encounter with, with school only came about when she arrived in Milwaukee. The eight years old was a conscientious student and a quick learner. She also learned to place her hand on her heart and with her fellow pupils to pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stood, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But what young Goldie perceived as liberty and justice was not so for her parents. American progress, mandatory and free education for all children was well and good. But Mother Bluma was, has just opened a grocery store and needed a helper. Neither father nor sister were willing to do the task and it fell upon Goldie to attend to the customers every early morning until mother returned from the market. Back in the old country, that was the rule. Children were expected to work with their parents, and parents had full authority over their children. Goldie was chronically late to school, and this, as she described in her memoirs, was the bile of her life. To Bloom's great surprise, Wisconsin law, reflecting one of the cornerstones of progressivism, had something to say about that. The law terminated her liberty to employ her own child. A teacher visited the home and informed Bluma that Goldie's place was in school, not at the shop, regardless of how essential her help was. But while Wisconsin law emphasized the child's right to education, Wisconsin law imagined the woman's destiny to be a part of, the, of her mother, to be that of mother and wife. In the good American family, mothers stayed at home rather than go to school, to work. Bluma worked very hard. She was in fact the family's primary breadwinner, but she wanted a better future for her daughters. And so when the bright and energetic and feisty Goldie graduated from elementary school and wished to enroll in high school and later become a teacher, her parents put their foot down. They also had a good argument. In the state of Wisconsin, a female teacher would be fired if she became pregnant. Motherhood and a teaching career were incompatible. What's the point of becoming a teacher then? Bluma had social ambitions. She wanted her sweet, bright Goldie, her favorite, to marry a man who was neither a manual laborer like her husband, nor a despised greenhorn like herself. Bluma also found a candidate, a certain Mr. Goodstein, a decent man with some money who liked the beautiful Goldie and was eager to marry. Goldie was shocked and resistant. The home became the scene of bitter and demoralizing quarrels. Both parents insisted that a clever, meaning educated girl, was her own worst enemy. Men are not interested in educated girls. Goldie was a good balabuste, housewife, and, was, and that was good enough for a good life. It was time to get married. Sister Shane came to the rescue from Denver, Colorado, where she moved to get treatment for tuberculosis. 
a terrible disease which she probably caught in the sweatshops of Milwaukee and Chicago, Shane advised Goldie to run away from home. Shane, or Jenny, as she now called herself, and her husband Shammai, who in America became Sam, were veterans of the Russian Jewish underground cells in Belarus. Their letters to Goldie instructed her to purchase a train ticket and keep her date, date of departure secret. She was to pack her belongings in a bundle and lower that bundle down the, down the window to the ground floor the previous night. Her best friend Regina would collect the bundle and deposit it at the train station. Goldie was also instructed to write a letter to her parents informing them of her departure. Early in the morning, Goldie was to drop the letter in the mailbox and head to the train station. The parents would learn of her departure when she was already on the train. Jenny also advised Goldie, and I quote, the main thing is never to get excited. Always be calm and act coolly. This way of action will always bring you good results. Be brave, end of quote. This advice stayed with Golda, and she put it into good use in the many political crises she had encountered throughout her adult life, among them the ter terrifying first days of the Yom Kippur War, where her entire cabinet was panicked. Here, if you will, you see a Russian, rather than an American influence, shaping the life of Golda Meir. One thing st stands out in Goldie's perfect execution of the plan. In future, she could be totally trusted to execute a plan, follow instructions, and keep a project confidential, be it a meeting with King Abdallah of Jordan in 1948, prior to Israel's War of Independence, or meeting with the French cabinet in 1956, prior to the Suez War. Denver, Colorado brought about a transformation in Goldie's life. In Denver, she found romantic life and informal education, but I'm not sure in what order. Sister Jenny loved company and valued the life of the mind. Her living room was a center for Russian Jewish immigrants, immigrant friends. One of the guests was young Maurice Meyerson, a shy, gentle, self-educated young man, passionate about art, music, and literature. In America of the progressive era, cities and towns offered the poor many free uh, public lectures and concerts in the park. Maurice invited the 15 years old Goldie to one and then to another event. He introduced her to classical music and to poetry. He showered her with compliments for her looks, for her good nature, for her brilliance. He worked as a sign painter and appears not to have been terribly ambitious. Maybe what in Yiddish is called a nebish. Pitiful, pitifully ineffectual is the English translation, just like her father. The television producers who crafted a woman called Golda, starring Ingrid Bergman, picked a tender story from Golda's early memory. Goldie was estranged from her parents and has now turned her back on Shana as well. At age 15, she lived in a tiny rented room alone in Denver. Maurice invited her to a concert in the park and the vulnerable Goldie was eager to impress her suitor. At Woolworths, also known as the Five and Dime store, she purchased a red straw hat, very becoming, she recalled, and she hoped, quote, Maurice, we like it. Hats were the fashion in America at the beginning of the 20th century, the jewel in the crown of the American feminine appearance. Recall that hats were a shopping item on her father's list the week they arrived in Milwaukee. A young lady had to wear a hat. A shopkeeper's daughter and penniless in Denver, Goldie did realize that purchasing a hat was a frivolous act. But she was eager to look pretty, and the hat was very becoming, as she recalled. She took the daring step and made the purchase. She was now an American girl. We also learn that she was coquettish. Appearance mattered to her. Some, many years later, described Golda, the old Golda, as any old Jewish lady from the Lower East Side. But let me assure you that until her 50s, Golda was a good-looking woman. She cared for her appearance and knew how to improve it. So let us just look at Golda. This is Golda as a little girl that's still in Kiev, 1904. 
This is Golda, actually, this is a photograph that she made especially for Maurice. So she will see the sexiness. Um, this is Golda in 1932. This is another Golda. And this is actually a picture that I really like. That's also from the 30s. Um, so a good looking Golda. Red was the only color available in the store. Did the color make a difference? It is, it is not audacious to speculate that given a choice, Golda would still have chosen red. Red is the color of love, of sexual attraction, of taking control. It is not surprising that Goldie set her eyes on red. In the early 20th century, red was also the color of revolutionary socialism. The revolutionary spasms shaking the world, including the United States, shaped Goldie's worldview. Red was the color of her emerging political convictions. And so on May Day, 1949, 36 years later, in the newly established state of Israel, Golda marched with her comrades of Israel's leading and socialist party, Mapai, raising the familiar red flags and proclaiming socialism now. You see, this is a very you know, Russian uh, poster. And it says here, uh, to uh, the redemption of the people and the person. So that was Zionism, both the person and the people at the same time. Um, shortly thereafter, at the age of 52, as Minister of Labor in David Ben-Gurion's cabinet, she led a most impressive and pioneering project of labor codification designed to protect the working class, an eight hour workday, mandatory vacation, prohibition on child labor, which was particularly dear to her heart, given her history, mandatory maternity leave paid for by the state, which you do not have here yet. This is 1952. And the jewel in her crown, social security. The, these are all parts of Golda's legacy. But let us return to Denver. She found love, but she also found, was introduced to the world of ideas. In Sister Shane's living room, the, she met self-styled intellectuals, all recent immigrants from Russia. In Yiddish, they argued endlessly and passionately, and Goldie was awed. She remembered discussion of, I quote, Hegel, Kant, Schopenhauer, Peter Kropotkin, and Emma Goldman, President Wilson and the U European situation, pacifism, the role of women in society, the future of the Jewish people, end of quote. She also discovered socialist Zionism, which became her life project. She said, I responded, I quote, I responded fully to the idea of a national home for the Jews, one place on the face of the earth where Jews could be free and independent. And I, I took it for granted that in such a place, no one would be in want or be exclo exploited. Goldie prevailed upon Maurice to immigrate to Palestine as soon as Lord Balfour made his famous declaration exactly 100 years ago, promising a Jewish national home in Palestine. It was at that moment that she became from Golda Mabovic to uh, Golda Meyerson. Arriving in Palestine in 1921, Goldie reclaimed her original name, Golda. She joined the kibbutz and immersed herself in the fulfillment of the social, uh, socialist Zionist dream. She distinguished herself from the, feminist, from the feminist kibbutzniks. Most kibbutz women at the time aspired to eradicate the traditional division of labor between men and women. Specifically, they resented being assigned to the kitchen. Golda had a more nuanced view. She endorsed kitchen work as a true contribution to the community and thereby flagged herself as somewhat more traditional. She also thrust herself into the emerging political scene. Already in 1923, Golda gave a speech at the second conference of the Labour Party. She was one of the very few who were allowed to deliver her speech in Yiddish. Her Hebrew was still very poor. In her speech, she strategically placed herself at the political center of the movement, distancing herself from the feminists. Golda understood very well the problem of women in modern society, particularly the tension related to family and work. But she has never been an activist feminist. 
gender equality, she opined, will emerge with time. For now, the interest of the Jewish people as a whole should be advanced. As we know, she was too quick to identify the needs of the Jewish male with the needs of the Jewish people, too willing to ignore the specific needs of women. The all-male leadership of the Zionist Labour uh, Party in Palestine immediately understood her value. She was passionate yet balanced. Her radicalism was their radicalism. Golda possessed a strategic talent, uh, which was also rare. She was a natural orator. She also spoke American English. In the aftermath of World War I, Ben-Gurion and his comrades already understood the significance of the United States as a rising world power and the value of American Jewry in the international struggle to create a Jewish state. A robust American accent, like Golda's, or not like mine, was invaluable. So here you see Goldie and Maurice. And here you see, right, this is Goldie in the, and these are all, you know, uh, photos that were commissioned, evidently. Uh, but the Golda in the kibbutz was um, uh, in charge of, uh, she liked the kitchen, but she uh, uh, went, uh, took a course in uh, taking care of, chick of chicken. And she is here, you can see her. Uh, here she is in the field, and here she is with her chickens, uh, which she did very well with the chickens, by the way. And she brought, uh, you know, she enabled the comrades to eat chicken from time to time and eggs every day, which was a big uh, success. Um, all right. Within 10 years of arrival, she had left the kibbutz, had two children, separated from Maurice, and fell in love with the powerful and senior labor leader, David Remez. Remez opened doors to Golda and served as a caring and astute coach. Under his mentorship, Golda continued to grow and mature as a politician and as a leader. By 1930, she was one of the most pow of the powerful, not the most powerful, but of powerful leaders of Mapai, as well as the Federation of Labor, the Istadrut. Let me return to Maurice for a second, because the gender lens also requires attention to the men. In their biographies, both Laura Kalman and Jane DeHart painted the portraits of Carolyn Agar, wife of Justice Fortas, and Marty Ginsburg, husband of Justice Ginsburg. Spouses matter. Maurice was an ineffectual intellectual, as we say, a nebuch. More like Woody Allen than like Clint Eastwood. He could write a book, he could quote a poem, but he could not play the valiant cowboy. In her mid-twenties, Golda needed a man of action, someone to build the country with, someone to discuss politics with, not abstract ideas. This, this was the reason they parted, and a part of her has always regretted the separation. They never divorced. From the late 1920s onwards, Golda traveled extensively and spent many months in the United States, fundraising and urging American Jews to support Zionism, which was not an easy task at the time. By 1949, after the establishment of the State of Israel, she entered the first Israeli cabinet as Minister of Labor. The first cabinet had 12 ministers, it was a very small cabinet. And you should be interested to know that of the 11 men in the room, 11 men and one woman, of the 11 men in the room, at least two had the distinction of having been Golda's lovers. <laughs> David Remes, we talked about him um, uh, before, and uh, Zalman, Saja, Zalman Shazar, Rubashov in those days, the third president of Israel. As a wife and mother, however, Golda would get a C. She left Maurice unhappy and miserable and badly neglected her young children. Her passion was politics, and that she did quite well. So here is Maurice, Golda, this is daughter Sarah, and son Menachem. Sarah eventually established a kibbutz in the south, kibbutz Revivim, and Menachem became a cellist. In Israel of the 1950s, Golda's party, Mapai, had 46 mandates out of 120 in the Knesset. If you want to compare, today the Likud has 30 uh, seats in the Knesset, and the Zionists came, the, the, the erstwhile Labour, 
has 24 seats. The, at that time, in 1949, in the 50s, Mapai, Mapai had 46 mandates, so a robust majority. The gate was open to implement a progressive Zionist vision, and Golda wasted little time. She presided over a most impressive lab, labor codification that is still holding. Despite the fundamental shift to capitalism and the values of the free market that have dominated Israel since the 1970s. That is, Israelis think that these labor uh, rights are natural rights. They were born with them, not something that Golda uh, constructed for them. Richard Hecht has written about the various controversies uh, around the observation of Shabbat in Israel, particularly in Jerusalem. As Minister of Labor, Golda was at the center of these conflicts. She was in favor of Shabbat as the official day of rest, but envisaged, envisaged a secular, relaxed interpretation of the meaning. She thought that access to entertainment on Shabbat, restaurants, movies, should be permitted so that people could go out and enjoy themselves. She also wanted power to issue work permits so that the industry does not uh, come to a halt. It was an uphill battle. As you know, Shabbat is still a contentious issue, which may cause the rise and fall of Israeli cabinets. Golda remembered her seven years as Minister of Labor as the best years of her life. It was at the ministry that her two passions thrived, her passion for the rights of the working person and her passion for an independent Jewish state. She had another important accomplishment. She met Tikkun with her children. They were already grown up and married, but she reached out, poured on them affection and attention, and it appears that the wounds were slowly healing. By the end of the seven years, Israel was preparing for war. France was willing to supply the arms. Under the table, it also promised a nuclear plans. In the cabinet, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Moshe Sharet, supported the purchase of arms, but opposed a war of choice. He only supported wars of self-defense. Prime Minister Ben-Gurion kicked Sharet out and brought Golda in. She became the first woman Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Western world. Golda was skeptical about war, about a war fought behind President Eisenhower's back. But she went along. When the American Empire strike back after the Suez Crisis, demanding full withdrawal and threatening sanctions, she was sent to the United States to help turn the tide. She found a very hostile United Nations and an unfriendly US administration. She worked a division of labor with Abba Iban, then Israel's ambassador to the United States. He crafted creative legal arguments. She was in charge of whipping public opinion, public support. At the end, a compromise was worked out that took Israel's concerns seriously. It could not have happened without, without her. In the aftermath, Israel experienced a stretch of 10 quiet years used for consolidation and growth. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol died two years after the stunning victory of the Six Day War. Golda was in retirement. Two middle aged generals competed for the position of Prime Minister. Unable to decide between them, the party invited Golda to lead the ship, to lead the ship of state. By March 1969, she was voted by parliament as the fourth prime minister of Israel, the first woman in the powerful position, and so far the only woman. Golda was ambitious, and this was an offer hard to refuse. But one should not underestimate her willingness to sacrifice. Golda genuinely wished to devote, devote time to her family and knew well that yet again the demanding job would undermine the desire. Yes, the decision must have been motivated by ambition, but she also knew that she could harness her considerable expertise to benefit her country. Almost immediately, she gained immense popularity at home and abroad, secured a visit to the Nixon White House, and at the age of 71, was dedicated to maintaining the geopolitical status quo. Old age and bold breakthroughs seldom go together. So here is Golda in 1970, 71. 
on the cover of Time magazine. This is actually September 1969. And this is with Nixon in the White House. Four years hence, in 1973, Egypt's President Anwar Sadat reached the conclusion that the political stalemate of neither war nor peace needed a mighty shakeup. Only war, he thought, would bring the Israelis to give up the territories it occupied in 1967. A simultaneous invasion from north and south of Israel's, of Israel's borders, he calculated, would force Israel to come to the negotiating table. Israelis were impervious to the dark clouds on, clouds on the horizon. Golda was assured by her generals, in and outside of the cabinet, that an Egyptian attack could not be forthcoming because conditions for Egyptian military success were not right. And besides, even were Israel to be attacked, the IDF would contain it forthwith. Quote, our situation has never been better, end of quote, people were assured, and they went about their business undaunted. Between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur of October 1973, things began to change. On Friday, October 5th, the eve of Yom Kippur, Golda and her cabinet realized that war was at the gate. Initially, Golda planned to spend Yom Kippur with her daughter's family in Kibbutz Revivim, but the growing tension made her decide to stay in Tel Aviv and spend the holidays with her son, Menachem. The cabinet meeting hastily called on Yom Kippur Eve was poor in attendance and short. Cabinet protocols recalled, Golda worries, recalled Golda's worries about the reports from the front. There was an eerie similarity between the unfolding events and those, or, uh, and those preceding the Six Days War, she said. And then the protocol records Minister of uh, Defense, Dayan, say, let us make sure that all the ministers agree to be called on the telephone if a consultation is necessary. Now remember, uh, for observant Jews, Yom Kippur was the sacred um, day of the year, and talking on the phone on Yom Kippur was totally taboo. Yes, Golda agreed. I shall ask everyone to leave deta detailed information concerning their whereabouts. She adjourned the meeting. Okay, then. Gmar Hatima Tova to all of you. That's the traditional Jewish uh, blessing uh, on the eve of Yom Kippur. The phone rang before dawn. Her military attaché delivered a message from the head of the Mossad. A joint attack will take place today, probably in the earlier evening. I knew it, she responded. The cabinet ministers were hastily called back into Tel Aviv. In their synagogues, they folded their talitot, put down the sidurim, entered their official vehicles, and drove down to Tel Aviv. In her office, early on Yom Kippur, Golda was listening to Dayan and the chief of staff make opposite recommendations. The chief of staff wanted an immediate mobilization of the entire reserve force. He also recommended a preemptive strike. Dayan, the Minister of Defense, remembering American anger in 1956, disagreed. It fell to Golda to make the decision. She ordered a partial mobilization of the reserves to be on the prudent side, but rejected the idea of a preemptive strike. Later, this decision proved to be painfully contentious. Why not use every means at your disposal to soften the blow? When in, su when in such a grave uh, danger, isn't it the sacred duty of a leader to do the utmost to uh, mitigate the damage? In the aftermath, Golda repeatedly explained her decision. In the balance, she said, stood a military consideration and a political one. She put her thumb on the scale in favor of the political imperative. Her vast experience in foreign affairs taught her that American support at a dead dire moment would be indispensable, and if she ordered a preemptive strike, she may not, may not get it. Indeed, as the war went on, and the word defeat was often mentioned in the cabinet meetings, she felt more confident of her decision. Now America was coming to the rescue, sending badly needed military equipment, airplanes, tanks, and ammunition. As Israel managed to pull itself by its bootstraps and prove once again its military superiority, the shaken Israeli public reeled against its leadership with furious outrage. Much of the criticism was justified. 
that the process of decision making was fundamentally flawed, not allowing for disinterested deliberation, that the failure to pursue a diplomatic solution to the status quo was a bomb waiting to explode, that the military leadership was allowed to rest on its laurels and developed hubris and myopia. In Israel, at this moment, Golda was turned, after the war, from an admired grandmother of the Jewish people into a nasty old woman. The ugly specter of misogyny emerged with horrifying force. Golda, commentators and politicians suddenly discovered, was a woman and bore all the negative attributes of one. I shall only give one example, but I have many. Michael Barzohar, an independent scholar who wrote the biographies of both Ben Gurion and Shimon Peres, published a book in 1990 titled Faces, Facing a Cruel Mirror, Israel's Moment of Truth. In it, he included a chapter criticizing Golda's policies and titled it The All Iron Lady. The Iron Lady from 10 Down Downing Street, he stated dryly, appears to be an affable ant compared to our own Golda. Golda, he stated, was responsible for most of the disasters that we have experienced during the 1970s. Why was that? Conceding that she was charismatic and driven, he, he said, and I quote, she was far from beautiful. Her taste in clothes was pathetic. She did not read books and her vocabulary was limited. On the next page, he summarized, and I quote, as a leader and head of state, she was utterly devoid of political imagination and the insightfulness required by, um, by statesmen. The old gender stereotype was working full time. It was because she was a woman that many of the harms were visited upon us. A woman is nasty, unnecessarily rigid, emotional, capricious, whimsical, unfit for public office. Plus, she was not even beautiful and did not dress well, as if this was a necessary qualification for the job, or as if the men he discussed in his book, and there were many, were all good looking and well-dressed. <laughs> no, but I think I had something before that. No? Okay, so this is Moshe Dayan. We'll get back to him momentarily. So this is, you know, to, uh, in terms of in Yiddish being a schlumper, the question is, who's more of a schlumper? You know? So uh, Barzar was a great admirer of Ben-Gurion, never addressed the question of how Ben-Gurion uh, dressed, you know, because it doesn't matter when a man, how a man dresses. But for a woman, you know, it was, in his mind, was different. Um, in hindsight, it seems that the anger and anguish accompanying the Yom Kippur War let loose the misogyny lurking under the Israeli social surface. It is true that Golda's leadership prior to the war was impaired. That a more creative and bold leadership, looking to the future rather than the past, could have led to the peace with Egypt that eventually had arrived six years later by Menachem Begin's Likud. Golda was too committed to the status quo. However, it is also true that during those early uh, hours of the Yom Kippur War, Golda displaced precisely the bold and deft leadership expected of a good and trusted leader. No man would have done better, certainly not that symbol of Israeli machismo, Moshe Dayan. He fell apart during the war and um, was actually uh, excluded from the liberation for a while because he was so uh, shocked and pessimistic. Only with the passage of decades have Israelis come to develop a more measured and nuanced understanding of Golda and her place in history. Her role during the Yom Kippur War is presently re-evaluated in a more empathetic way and her decades of leadership are beginning to be viewed as an asset rather than as a liability. Finally, people are willing to recognize her many achievements as well as her failures. In 2016, the state, Israel State Archives finally published a volume documented her career and action after they did all of the other prime ministers, Rabin and Begin and everybody, finally they came to Golda, presenting her political career in a more nuanced and fair way. And in the United States, a biography uh, referring to uh, Golda as Lioness was just published. In the beginning of 2017, 
Israel launched its ambitious high-speed rail project that will introduce a sophisticated, sophisticated transportation system to its congested urban center. It was decided to name the excavation machines after Israeli women, those who have been hitherto neglected and ignored in Zionist history. This by itself is a not worthy development, an effort to break away from the negative female stereotypes, to make tikkun. The first excav excavation machine to be deployed was named Golda. Israelis have always known that Golda was much more complex and multifaceted, multifaceted, person, multifaceted person than the woman remembered in other, uh, in other areas of the world. They are now coming to terms with the fact that Golda, in fact, made a major contribution to the welfare of the state of Israel, that she is one of the most formidable women of the 20th century, and that regardless of her flaws, we can and should look up to her and be proud of her. There is some truth to the famous saying that the arc of, just, of, the, moral, of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you. While people are thinking about questions for you, uh, can I ask a question? Please. Um, could you elaborate a bit, uh, Panina, on the idea that uh, the war's reaction, the 73 war, Yom Kippur War, uh, unleashed this wave of misogyny yes. uh, against Golda. Could you elaborate upon that a little bit yeah. more for us? Yes, thank you. It's a very good question. So, uh, so you, when we are, you, when you, the, the Yom Kippur War was a terrible trauma for Israelis, a terrible trauma. It was as traumatic as the War of Independence. Okay. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, uh, an illustration, uh, 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 2,800 Israelis were killed in that war. You know, it's, it's considerable. It's, it's like the uh, death toll uh, in the United States during the Civil War. It was horrendous. Uh, plus 6,000 uh, uh, wounded, wounded seriously, because if you were not wounded seriously, they didn't count you. So Israelis were totally stunned, especially they expected after 67 that we are the bosses of the world and you know, nobody can undermine us. Um, uh, so now, when you are so traumatized and shocked, this is psychology, you tend to blame something. You look around to blame somebody, okay? And to blame somebody, who would you blame? The, the prime minister is the first, uh, you know, first exhibit one that you want to, now, because she was a woman, they could also say to yourself, this would not have happened to us if we would have had a male uh, prime minister. And that, I would want to say, was also encouraged by some ministers in the cabinet who wanted to be prime ministers themselves, okay? And who were themselves uh, uh, misogynists. Okay? There was uh, considerable misogyny in uh, Israel at the time, okay? The, the disbelief that a woman can be uh, in politics. And that actually is also one of Golda's faults, that Golda did not encourage enough women in politics, so that people did not see too many of them. So that's the... Um, yeah, do you view any current, like, Israeli female politicians, like Tippi Livni, for example, as, like, successors to Golda Meir's legacy? Yes, yes, there is, you know, so I think Tsipi Livni definitely builds on Golda's shoulders, and I think it's very important that we rehabilitate Golda so that Tsipi Livni and other women politicians can, can, can confidently say to themselves, there was something before, somebody before us and we can do it too. That's very, very important. Um, now, if you, if you followed the history of Tsipi Livni, she almost became prime minister. You know, she almost became prime minister, and she is certainly very good. But that's the Israeli misogyny that was unleashed, okay? That people don't believe that a woman can lead the country when it comes to issues of security. Did, right here, did any of the men on, um, in Golda's cabinet accept any of the responsibility for the Yom Kippur War? Uh, that's a very good question. A very good question. So the Minister of uh, Justice accepted responsibility and resigned. And he said to, his cabinet, to the cabinet, everybody should resign. 
So they decided not to resign. She also decided not to resign. Remember, this was right after the war. These were very difficult times. So to resign was, was you know, and start negotiations about a new cabinet, that was not an easy matter, okay? Uh, and there was a lot of stuff on the, on the table in terms of dealing with the Egyptians, dealing with the Syrians, dealing with the American government. It was not easy. Um, uh, Diane actually was not happy about taking responsibility. He always, he, Diane always knew to uh, blame somebody else. That was his specialty, okay? And he did, you know. Unfortunately. Yes, uh, Richard, tell me who to... Uh, this has really been very, very instructive. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that I haven't heard anything in your com uh, uh, remarks about her feelings about the Palestinians. Yes. And could you say something about what her view was of the prospect for Israel and Palestinians living side by side? Yes. Okay, it's a very, very good question. Thank you for asking me. Um, uh, she, um, uh, she went, she underwent uh, uh, different uh, uh, changes as Israel um, was going forward, okay? So in the beginning, if you are talking about her early life in the kibbutz and afterwards, she, um, she understood the Palestinian position and she also thought that uh, what needs to be done is to divide the country. You know, that is the partition resolution uh, was something that she supported. Okay? And in her visit to King Abdallah in 1948, she offered the king to split the country along the borders of the partition resolution. Okay? And he refused to do it. Uh, for a variety, I can go, to, go into it if you want, but, uh, and I got into it in, with, in my book, but, um, uh, in any event, she did recognize the Palestinians. As time went by, as time went by, after the 67 war, when a, 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 a camp in Israel became more and more insistent on keeping the territories and talking about the greater Israel, okay, when that happened, she slowly, uh, for political reasons, basically, joined them, okay, and started talking about the Palestinians as, as uh, a non-national entity, okay, just people rather than a nation. It, it was at that time that she said, made this uh, famous remark, there is no Palestinian people, I was also a Palestinian, okay. Now, it's true that she was also a Palestinian, but there are two meanings to the word Palestinians. You know, that is a little trick that we do in law school when we ask Palestinian, and then we have to ask, what does it mean a Palestinian? A Palestinian can mean a member of a nation, of the Palestinian nation, and a Palestinian can also mean somebody who holds Palestinian, a Palestinian passport, okay? These are two separate things. When she said, I was also a Palestinian, she said, I also had a Palestinian passport. I myself had a Palestinian passport. It doesn't make me feel like a Palestinian. And that was, uh, so she did all kinds, she, she dropped all kinds of remarks that she thought would appease the right, okay, about the Palestinians. But the truth is, as I said, she didn't think through the issue of what is going to happen in the occupied territories. That was her problem. That was the defect in her leadership. That she had enough power to push forward some solution, but she didn't. That, that, was what, that, that was what I was referring to as her commitment to the status quo. We have the, the territories, we are gonna stay there, and you know, in a few years after I leave and another person comes, the Israeli people will vote again, let them make a decision. I'm not gonna do anything now. That was her, you know. Um, I'm, I'm curious about something. Um, after she ran away from home, um, did she ever reestablish a relationship with her parents and, and oh, yeah. family? So, uh, of course, her parents uh, were devastated. You have to go to the microphone. Thank you for reminding me. Her, <laughs> her parents were uh, devastated. Uh, her father, at a certain point in time, did the, you know, the usual, uh, maybe it's a Jewish trick, sending, him, sending her a letter saying, your mother is very sick and very distressed. 
and it's time for you to come back home. So after several letters like that, you know, not I am devastated, your mother is devastated, yes? So uh, after, after several such um, letters, she decided to go back home. And she decided she went back home and the parents let her go through high school. She was 15 years old. Or maybe at that time already 16 years old, but that's all. She went through high school. Maurice already came to Milwaukee. And by the age of 18, she got married. And they were prepared to go to uh, Palestine. So everything happened very quickly. And her mother was not happy with Maurice, as you can imagine, because there was no prospect of some, you know, good living there <laughs> from this guy. Yeah, unfortunately, we've come to the end of a very interesting uh, talk, Benina. Um, you, know, you know, let me remind you that if you want to see this extraordinary mind of Benina Lahav at work, uh, her book on Shimon Agranat is still available in the University of California Press. Let us hope that um, she will complete the manuscript of this book very quickly and that we will be able to publish it, I hope, in the University of California Press. It's been tremendous to meet you, um, to have you here in Santa Barbara, and I'm thankful to Professors DeHart and uh, Kalman for helping us bring you here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.